My name is Richard Turner. I'm a keynote motivational speaker, and I also am an entertainer. I demonstrate how many ways I can take your money at the card table. I'm going to be on Dov Barron's show, and we are going to be talking about winning with the hand you've been dealt. Delta is an acronym. D stands for dreams. E stands for excellence. A stands for analysis. L stands for loyalty. T stands for tenacity. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty Interview Series. I'm your host, Dov Barron, the founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness so that you can reach that next level of clarity focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. Today, we're going to be taking an insider look at why some people have all the advantages and fail, while others seem to have the odds stacked against them, and yet they still excel. What's the difference? As you are tuned in today, remember that you can chat about this show as you listen in or to past shows, past episodes, by going to our Facebook group, Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast in Facebook. There you can chat with our guests, you can chat with the other listeners, and let's hear what you think about the show. If you're a new listener, a new viewer to the show, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in, we're about to go full Monty. Remember, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and wherever you tune into your podcast. And uh, as we always need your help to stay relevant, so please get yourself over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. When you do so, again, get over to that Facebook page, uh, Facebook group, Dolph Brown's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast, and there, tell us that you did a review on iTunes, and maybe we'll give you a shout on the live show. Also, we are on traditional radio stations across the United States every Monday and Thursday, all the way from Las Vegas to Philadelphia, uh, Georgia, Florida, Wisconsin, all over the show. So tune in. If you're a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners with a potential of 2.5 to 4 million listeners for every single show. We're honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. And you can also find us on Google Home and Alexa. Simply say, play Dove Baron Podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. As a leader, whether you're a CEO, someone in the C-suite, a sales leader, an entrepreneur, or a leader in any capacity, you probably know that not only have you got to become the best, but what about becoming the best against all the odds? That's important. Think of something that you want to do or achieve and think about what happens if you lost one of your greatest resources and put you at a disadvantage. Now think about how would you, what, what would you do to get over that? Right now, I want to ask you, what are the disadvantages that you feel you've been dealt? Now, what if you could take that crappy hand and turn it into your greatest advantage? Well, stay tuned because our guest today is Richard Turner. His unparalleled skills with a deck of cards, yes, with a deck of cards, have been repeatedly featured on worldwide television, including Penn and Teller's TV series called Fool Us. I, uh, <laughs> Penn and Teller said Richard fooled us every single move he did. Every single move. He is the, uh, he's, uh, there's a new documentary movie about him called Delt. It's won Audience Choice Award at South by Southwest Film Festival with rave reviews in the New York Times and LA Times. Delt is 95 on Rotten Tomatoes, five stars on iTunes, variety called uh, Richard Turner, nothing short of dazzling. And they said d- the, d- the documentary knocked them dead. Now you might be thinking, why has Dove Barron got a guy who fooled Penn and Teller on his leadership show. Well, just wait and you'll see. Richard Turner is a card mechanic, a manipulator, whose talent, humor, poise, and eloquence have made him a highly sought-after stage entertainer and Fortune 500 speaker. 
he has entertained and entranced millions of people, including celebrities like, you may remember him, Johnny Carson, and even Bob Hope, even people like Brad Pitt and the legendary Muhammad Ali. On top of all that, the guy has sixth degree black belt in karate. And to tell you this, I tell you this because at the age of 13, Richard Turner's vision deteriorated to 2,400. You've got a 2020, 2,400. That's twice the level deemed legally blind. So ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and help me welcome Richard Turner! Welcome! Good to have you here, my man. Well, howdy, howdy, howdy. I'm, I'm honored to be with you. Thank you. It's, I am really excited to have you on. And I got to tell you a little bit of backstory because a friend of mine was telling me that they saw the documentary and he goes, you have got to have this guy on your show. And I said, why? And he goes, because of what you talk about around impact. My, my work is about finding your purpose and having impact. And I have a definition of impact. And that definition seems to be so well clear in, in what it is. You see, I believe dim, that impact is the ability to make somebody believe something about themselves that they previously thought was un, impossible. And by definition, I am certain that you, by your very state of being, have done that for so many others. But somebody did it for you. Tell us about who gave you this belief that the impossible was actually possible for you. I actually had a number of mentors in my life. One of them, the first one was my karate instructor, Master John Murphy. He kind of laid the foundation for me to believe that no matter what the obstacle, you can power your way through it. Yes. Uh, another one was Steve Terrell, who was my first stage director oh, 45 years ago, 1972. Uh, he, I'd, I'd be on stage getting, trying to, rehearsing for a scene, and I was not looking at the audience. I was looking off to the side because I had no forward vision at that time. Right. And uh, so I was looking off the sides. And he said, that looks wrong to the audience. Can you look at them? Play the part of a sighted person. A blind person plays the part, a sighted person plays the part of a blind person. You flip the roles. You're a blind person. You play the part of a sighted person. Amazing. And then he watched me practicing with the cards in and out, day and night, before and after scenes. He said, you love cards. If you become the best card man in the world, you will earn the respect of others. When you earn their respect, that will open doors for you. And it'll the world will the world will be your oyster. Now there was there was one particular person who, you know, I I, I watched the documentary about it and I thought it was like fascinating, and that was Di Vernon. Yeah, Tell us the story that. of Di Professor Di Vernon because for me he is this personification of, you know, making somebody believe something as impossible as possible for them, and, and, and he, so tell us about that because that was fascinating. Well, a little back on, on Di Vernon, he's yeah. the, over the past hundred years, he's the most influential person in the area of sleight of hand, close-up magic, cards, and so forth for, for the past hundred years. He was born in 1894. He lived to be not over 98 years old. And he, he was known as the man who fooled Houdini, and that took place back in the early 1920s. Wow. He took a liking to me. I first met him in 1975 because I started practicing with cards at about seven, and I had developed some pretty difficult moves like bottom deals, middle deals, uh, second deals, and so forth. And I earned the privilege of meeting with him. We met at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. Right. And, um, and, and of course, my work at that time was really, from my standpoint today, bad. But uh, he took a liking to me. And because he saw that I was as obsessed with what I was doing as he was with, with his uh, cards and coins, whatever he was working on, uh, and that I would literally put in an average of 14 hours a day practice. I'd work practice 10 to 20 hours a day. Average was 14. That's and he insane. would, he started giving me challenges. He would say, Oh, you know, Richard, the way you do that is like this. And he would, he would put my hands. I'd feel his hands. He would say, take the cards. They need the, the fingers need to be all on the sides when you do this move. And so he would describe things to me. And I believe that he was able to do it and others were able to do it. And it was not for years afterwards that I finally find out from him that he had made them up. The way that I was doing is the way the way I was doing them is the way he wished he was able to do it and literally spent a half a century trying to do them in that way. And so because I believed it could be done, I made the impossible 
I took possible out of impossible, basically. That you know, I just love that story, that part alone. So you were too, you know, because of the lack of sight, you were too naive to recognize this was not possible. He had enough conviction and belief in you to to sell it to you as possible. And because you believed in him, and, and this is, you know, was so important for us as leaders is to understand that we carry so much power for the people that we influence to, to have them believe in something that they may not believe in themselves. And he, he did that even though he couldn't do it himself. And I just think that's amazing. Right. And you never know one little line. I have single lines that people have said to me that had a life changing impact on me. Yes. And one, another one that Vern said was, it, it was similar to what Steve Terry said, said, he said, if you can do anything, it doesn't matter what it is. If you can do anything better than everyone else in the world, people will try to break down your doors to meet you. And another thing he said uh, that stuck with me is, is you don't have to worry about chasing after money. If you're world-class, you don't have to chase after money. Money will find you. It's a byproduct of yeah. success and becoming the best. And though, and he just said it, and we were presenting in a parking lot when he said that to me, 40 something, 45, <laughs> 45, whatever, how many years ago it was, right. but I, I never forgot it. That's very cool. So, so let, let's, let's sort of step back a little bit, because as I said in the intro, and, and people may have missed it, you know, you were not born blind. And I know you don't even like that whole classification because of the limitations of it, but you were not born blind. And, and for those of us with vision, I don't know that we can ever even begin to conceive what it would be like to wake up one day and go, oh, you're going blind and you're going to be blind within a very short period of time. Can you, can you remember that? Can you remember going from knowing you can see to having vision challenges and then discovering you're going to be blind? Oh, of course. It was like I can remember it as if it was yesterday, even though it was 1963. Right. I, my sister and I, my sister's name is Lori Drott, and I call her my genius sister. She uh, was also in the film Delt, uh, and she also lost her vision. We both got scarlet fever, and we wow. don't know if that was the cause of it, but, but it was after that, that in my case, I'm sitting in my classroom, fourth grade, watching the uh, teacher write things on the chalkboard, and all of a sudden everything went fuzzy, just wow. almost instantly. And I went, what was that? And then I look at my book, and all of a sudden the print that was there before was gone. And so she's, I told her something's wrong. She sent me to the nurse. And then they started doing test after test, and it was determined that there was some kind of uh, macular degeneration taking place. And how it went is from from nine nine years old to thirteen or so. I was is when the macula, the center of the eye, went south. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so then I was twenty over four hundred, which, like you said earlier, was is twice as low as what's considered legally blind. <clears throat> Excuse me. Through my throat one more time. Anyway, and so. Up until my 20s, my vision was twice as low as what's considered legally blind. And to give you a picture of what that look, what that means. Yeah. 2020 is normal vision. 20 over 400 means what you see at 400 feet, I, I would have to see at 20 feet. Wow. Uh, what you see at 40 inches, I'd have to have it see at two inches. Now the card you can see 40 inches away, I'd have it right between my right in front of two inches from my eye to see what it is. But then uh, the macula and the, the retina continued to degenerate to where there was nothing left that is real. And I do have a very unusual, rare condition called Charles Bonnet syndrome, or in French, it's Charles Bonnet syndrome. It was first documented in 1760 by Charles Bonnet. And uh, Dr. Oliver Sacks calls it seeing with the mind's eye. And he probably has written more about it than anybody. And up until 1990, there were only like six documented cases. And I'm probably the most extreme case. And to give a quick definition of what Charles Bonnet syndrome is, yeah. I see my subconscious in external space. In other words, what you see, like when you're dreaming or imagining, I see in front of me. I don't see black like a normal blind person. No. I see right now I'm in what I call the blue spectrum. So I see thousands of different images, every subconscious image you could imagine layered on top of all different shades of uh, royal blue, blue, turquoise blue, green, emerald green, all the way down the line. Right. And I can instantly focus in on any image, have a zoom in. I can have it rotate. 
I can want, design a house or building or not, I've never designed a building, house, furniture, board games, puzzle games, play games, solve problems uh, with this thing. I, the easiest way to think, way to describe is I could write in the air, like a phone number, and I'll see it floating in the air, just like you'd see it on a computer screen. I have what's called an eidetic memory. I take a picture of it and I never forget it. That's how I, re I memorize scripts uh, when I'm doing keynote speaking and things like that to adapt it to that particular client. So that, that's really interesting. So because, again, when we think of eidetic memory, people, you know, just so people understand, that's what we used to call a photographic memory. There's no such right. thing. But eidetic memory um, is as close to that as we can imagine. So, but one would think to have a photographic memory, one would have to take a photograph with one's mind, meaning you are seeing something. And so yours is like, you know, it's pretty fascinating when we, you know, when we hear about people with an eidetic memory, go, wow, wow, I wish I had that. But an eidetic memory when you're blind, dude, come on. <laughs> like, so you're taking, a, you have an eidetic memory of blackness is what it sounds like, right? Yeah, well, I, I've never lived in it. That's one of the colors I don't see as black or white. I see everything wow. else under the sun, but black and white. And of course, what I'm seeing obviously is not there. You yeah. can put me in a vault without a bit of light, and I will still see vivid colors, patterns, shapes, images, uh, as if it, like if you're on a movie theater stage with the still cells on the lights and the shine, light shining through those colored cells. That's how I, I see things. So it's actually a very beautiful world that I live in. But the downside is I still have all the disadvantages of not actually seeing what's really there. Hence uh, why I have such a low hair, high hairline. I've rubbed all the hair off from all the things I've ran into over the years. <laughs> good, good excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I know I got to come up with something. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm not really going bold. I'm not getting old. No, just, you just of rubbed it off. <laughs> Legends. So... You, um, I, I was reading that you know, as a kid, you were bullied because of because of this, yeah. and that yeah. inspired and you. Off. I'm sorry, and that and that inspired you to want to study martial arts and, and karate. Tell yes. us a little bit about that. Well, uh, when I was five years old, I was in my painting class, and all the kids were were doing finger paint. All the kids were spear smearing paint all over the faces and nose of the table, and I did a complete seascape from a picture I saw in a National Geographic magazine. And the teachers go, wow, look what Ricky did. They called me Ricky back then. Sure. And then so first, second, third, fourth grade, I was, the, I was the, probably the best artist in the school. And um, so the, uh, I, excuse me for uh, going blank. Uh, go back to your question real quick. Oh, so, so you had seen, so you did this painting. Was that from a memory of something you'd oh, seen? Yes, we're talking about the kids harassing me. Yeah. Yes. And so um, I'm, now at a boys club competition and there are two boys and they're going, Hey, blind boy. And they'd call me Mr. Magoo, like the cartoon character playing by Jim Backus back in the sixties. Yep. And um, they would flip the bird in front of my face. Say, hey, Magoo, how many fingers am I holding up? And that while I was distracted, the other kid picked the wallet out of my back pocket. He then dangled it in front of my face and said, Hey, Magoo, got any money? When I grabbed for my wallet, he'd throw it over my head to his friend behind me in kind of a cruel game of keep away. And then they started taking my wallet and slapping me across the face where they go on. Can you see to grab your money blind boy, huh? And then finally the other kid jumped on my back, drove me to the ground, took his foot and kicked me right in the ribs. And they laughed, ran off with my uh, money. They took my money, which at that time was $3, which was a mass fortune to me. <laughs> and sure. threw my wallet back at me and then said, thanks for the hot dog blind boy. Cause they went to buy hot dogs with my money. Right. And, uh, at that time, one of the shows on television that I really liked was The Green Hornet, starring Bruce Lee as Cato. And yeah. for the first time on television, you saw someone do a standing split, standing where his, one of his feet go and kick somebody right in the face. And that's when yeah. I thought, I'm going to learn karate and one day kick in their faces. And it was so 1971 so, that I started. So that was, so, but were you, you were blind at that point. Yes, I was. I was. I was uh, legally blind at that point. I'm, yeah, I'm so, totally blind now. But at that point, yeah, I was. But at that point, you were legally blind. So yes. could you? I mean, because then the question obviously becomes: Well, how could you see him do a do a split kick? Oh, well, I was always right next to, uh, within six inches of the TV screen, blocking everybody's view. Uh, <laughs> view to their oh, you must have. You must have been lovely to watch TV with. Oh <laughs> no, I was. Yeah, I can't see the screen. 
<laughs> when I'd go to the movie theaters, I would be right in the front row trying to catch, capture, as much, capture as much as I could. And of course, uh, when I was on a show called That's Incredible back in 80, it was filmed in 81. They I remember that show. My eye doctor. And I said, no, I said, don't, don't give him any impression that my vision is wor any worse than it is. And he says, you won't be able to tell the difference because you're going to see it from a person that has lost his vision. So it's going to look twice as w uh, blurry to you as it will to them. And anyway, so I, I didn't like people uh, uh, talking about uh, how I could or could not see. I tried to make it as if I could see when, when I couldn't see. Right. So you, you went on, you, you, you went on and got a sixth stand black belt. Mm -hmm. Um, was that part of the inspiration to f fight off the bullies or was it something else? Well, uh, yeah, it, I, I started in 61. I'm, no, I'm sorry. I started in the karate in 71. I'm probably sorry. Yeah. And it took me 13 years because the school that I attended, uh, my karate instructor, master John Murphy and Doug, master Douglas, they, uh, had one of the toughest black belt tests in the country. And uh, it was so tough that the, most of the testing and training took place across the border in Tijuana, Mexico, because they didn't want any lawsuits and deal with le legal issues. And uh, I had to take on 10 men in a row, three minute rounds each. And wow. there were really no rules. You, uh, the only real rules is you, you, could, you, uh, you didn't take out someone's knees. The groin right. was an open shot. And uh, I ended up with us, you know, this is first, you can see all this is, yeah, you can uh, see the videos of it. You saw yeah. clips of it. I did. Yeah, and then and anyway, I ended up with a smashed bloody nose from the, you know, the second round, which I I was swallowing blood for all nine rounds. I uh, had my groin kicked up into my throat. I had a ruptured eardrum. I got a ridge hand right on my right ear and ruptured my right eardrum. And I caught a roundhouse kick on my right arm about two inches above the elbow, and he snapped that arm in half. So I fought three and a half rounds with a broken arm. And, and the pressure was on me big time because I, at that point, you know, I had international fame because of my card work right. and, you know, on television worldwide. And so the press were there, including ABC and one of the biggest papers in the country, the Los Angeles Times. And uh, wow. so the next day, the whole bloody mess was spread across the front page of the Los Angeles Times sports section. And what ticked me off at the time is they had to say blind man earns black belt. And I thought, I earned this on my own I, on the, in the same way everyone else did. And, uh, and I didn't, you know, I, it, I know it's more spectacular to people. And, and, yeah, uh, but, but it's not just that, Richard. I, I think I have, to, I have to call that because you didn't earn it the way others did. Because, first of all, this is okay. nine or ten rounds of three minutes. I, I, I boxed and I did martial arts. You know, I, I am that guy. I'm back from there. And I remember doing Western boxing and I did Chinese boxing, Choi Le Fat and Wen Chung. And, and I remember going in the ring for three one minute rounds. And at the end of three one minute rounds, it felt like your arms were carrying 45 pound dumbbells and you're exhausted. Yeah. You're in combat for nine rounds. And Ten for, rounds. Ten right, rounds. And, and you had a right, turn around, and you had a broken arm. In the really process, nice. aside from the fact that you could probably taste your own testicles from people. Yeah. Being, <laughs> oh, being, yeah. In fact, you, you can watch it on the film. If you watch the whole thing, uh, uh, richardturner52.com, there's a page of all kinds of videos. And one is right. all times. And I, I, the guy it was actually, 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 after the referee said, break up, the guy took his knee and rammed it up between my legs and just drove my testicles out my throat. Right. Holding my, my groin, rocking back and forth, going, uh, 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 sure, yeah. like, you know, 10 minutes 10 seconds to recover and murphy goes are you ready and i'm still just going uh, uh, uh. and then a minute later he didn't give me any more time he goes hajime which means fight you yeah. see me turn run down that guy we get in a clench and then they say they yell yeah may stop fighting and you see me take my knee and ram it up ram it up between his legs and then i get balled out for it he says i just told him no shots after the after i call stop don't you do it too i said hey i had to pay to return the favor <laughs> so you know with all of this i mean you know we haven't even touched on the card stuff and because you are absolutely i mean and i recommend that anybody listening watching this go and look at richard's stuff we'll give you a website where you can go and look at all that in a minute 
Well, you can just tell them, Richard, where can they go look at some of your stuff? I mean, obviously, tons of stuff on YouTube, but is there a specific site? Uh, RichardTurner52.com is my website. Right. And then my YouTube channel is Asa T52. A, okay. a, capital A, small s, small a, capital T52. My son's name is Asa. His last right. name is Turner. And right. uh, so if, I named it after him. So Asa T52. But if you just Google Richard Turner, it'll... It'll yeah, lot, lots of lots of stuff comes up, and and oh. so because I don't, I mean, I, it, watching you do the car stuff is insane. I mean, I think it would be insane for somebody who has sight to be able to do it. But you, you know, the way you pull out these cards, it's like, you know, um, it makes David Blaine look bland, which is fascinating. <laughs> yeah, they're two different things. He's doing, you he's know, doing magic. I get it. It's different. It's different altogether. But and it's, uh, and it's profound. And and as you talked about in the videos that I've seen this this ability you've developed in in your touch to be mm-hmm. able to sensitize and, and 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 know it's it's amazing so i need to ask you this just cuz i out of my own curiosity in a card deck is every card different does each one feel different to you i can feel things about cards that nobody else can feel um <laughs> Uh, I've, I'm actually the touch analyst for the United States Playing Card Company. Just about every pack of cards you buy, they've made all the nice, the main labels like Bicycle, B, yeah. Oil, Steamboat, Kim, they make virtually all of them. And because I can tell things about a card, they put me on retainer about 20 something years ago to help them with their card manufacturing. So, yes, I can tell things about cards and I'll, without, I'm not going to give away personal. Uh, techniques and stuff but i'll oh. give you some for instance what i can do is i can give you a deck card say shuffle them up tell me how many players you want to have in the game tell me yeah. what card game you want to play and tell me which player do you want to have received the winning hand say they you want seven card stud you want five players you want the third hand to win you want the third hand to have a full house you can hand me the deck i'll deal it out that person will win and i will even let you grab the cards out of my hand anytime as I'm dealing, reshuffle them, take, even take cards out, do anything you want to try to screw things up. And uh, I'll still put the, the best hand in that position. It's, it's insane. I mean, watching it is like so entertaining. It's so insane, the ability that you have. But, you know, the, which Bill brings Teller, us... It was fun for Penn and Teller because they never seen anything like that before. Oh, I'm sure. And Penn and Teller was sitting there trying to signal, bring down the trophy two minutes into my eight minute act and they're going over the head pieces. Don't bring it down. We want Richard, Richard to do his entire act. Yeah. The, 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 let's define to your audience something real quick. And that is the yeah. difference between a card magician and a card mechanic. Yes. The general public don't realize there's a distinction. No. A card mechanic is somebody who can control the outcome of a card game. Magicians yes. learn slights, which are difficult to on a level, yeah. but the purposes of fooling a card mechanic is somebody who can deal cards from, Different places of the deck, I can deal off the bottom, any any place from the middle, second from bottom, uh, second card down, and have it all appear as if the cards are coming from the top. Or I can shuffle cards back into the deck into perfect numerical order. Or I can shuffle, you want seven players, or you say you want five, six players, fourth position, you like sevens. I can shuffle the sevens to the fourth, tenth, sixteenth, and twenty-second position, hand you the deck, you deal them out, and the, every uh, sixth card at the fourth player will appear a seven. Um, which requires the ability to be able to feel the exact number of cards by touch as you're shuffling without even missing one card as you're lacing those cards up. So the, just Those are just some for instances. That's crazy. So, and then one of the fun things that I like doing is within a half a second, you say, hand me 10 cards, 20 cards, 37 cards, whatever it is, yeah. within half a second, I can hand you any volume or I can take your personal business cards and you can hand me the stack and I can tell you how many are in the volume. Once I calibrate by feeling one to know how thick your particular cards That's are. That's crazy. So, so I, I'm really interested in this, this question from you, which is how would you define impossible? I say have a healthy disregard for the word impossible. Yeah. You know, because, you know, almost everything that I do, I just returned from, do, I can tell because this will air after the other one airs. I just yeah. returned from a film and a television special in Germany called Showdown of the World's Greatest Magicians. Mm-hmm. And they three different categories. 
and they picked the top card, two top card men to battle it out between each other. And I was the card man picked and I, I won, by the way. And it was in the middle of the Porsche arena surrounded by 4,000 uh, people. And um, uh, anyway, I, I, there again, I, my age is showing up. I forgot the <laughs> point that I was going to make. Uh, that's okay. Because this, I mean, it, it is, it is inc- truly fascinating because you have defined you have defied rather impossible in all kinds of exactly ways. What we're talking about, impossible. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and what I was going to say is, I can. And I, what I have so much fun with is the more educated the pe- people are, the more I like it. You know, I was the keynote speaker at Facebook uh, last month. Uh, oh, yeah? my Apple and uh, all these tech companies, Viv, uh, Viv Labs, the guy that invented uh, Siri is a friend of mine, and you know, there's a new thing coming out that's going to make Siri look like a, a ABC, and. Nice. Uh, and other other companies, and and I would one time I uh, the IBM had me come in to entertain their top C, uh, their top PhDs. There were like twenty one of them. It was on a private boat, private yacht, and uh, five at a time. I would sit there and do things. And they're going, you know, it's just so much fun to take these business guys that are just really sure. brilliant and just turning them into kids, just exactly joyful kids, and they're joyful. They're just going, yeah. what? And you know, you know, some people like Muhammad Ali, who I, was a wonderful man. And uh, you know, you go, Richard, how can you do it? How can you? I shuffle those cards, and you win every time. And it's just so it is businessmen, and the smarter the person is, the more fun it is because the more they understand the difficulty involved. And in my own area, the gambling and the magic community, they understand, they appreciate it probably more than anybody because they know exactly what you know what it takes and how really difficult the moves techniques and so forth that i'm uh demonstrating are one of the one of one of the stories that i just loved and i thought you know i thought this guy is my kind of nutcase because i'm a bit i I was a full-blown adrenaline junkie for many years and i used to do a lot of free climbing um, um, for people who don't know what that is that's climbing without ropes ropes it's the sport for the moderately insane i had eyesight <laughs> and did you, you see the that same I thing thousand foot cliffs without equipment i, I did just, used to swing on the trapeze i mean you have a picture of me swinging on the trapeze with david nelson from ozzy and harriet nelson way back when um to 40 foot high falls that tightrope around the rim of multi-story buildings you know i'd help uh, hunt hunting Jeez. sharks. Actually, you know, I don't want to say it sounds, sounds too much like a fish story, but it's true. Um, but yeah, I've hunted. But tell us, tell us, Richard, tell our listeners the motorcycle story. Because for me, that was like, I got to tell you, folks, when I heard this story, I almost wet myself laughing because uh, I you. know for sure this story could not exist at this time. But <laughs> that time in the days of the friendly cop, it was fantastic. Please tell us that story, Richard. I'll, 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 I'll intro it with a couple others, you know, because, you know, growing up with vision like Magoo can be really entertaining, you know, like my wife, you know, she's so immune to me running into things. We're lounging in our lounge chairs in the house and the phone rings. I dash to answer the phone. I ran square into the corner wall. I split my head wide open. I'm gushing blood. She looked up from her book and said, now that one had to hurt. When you get off the phone, you to get to wipe up the blood. I'm on the driving range. I like to, well, I'm not a very good golfer, but I still like to. Uh, I'm with my dentist, a guy named Richard Drake, and uh, he went to talk to somebody. I'm putting the balls down. Each time I hit the ball, I made a slight adjustment to the left. And I didn't realize after a while, I was driving those balls at nine o'clock right at the pro shop. And over the speakers, this guy going, Hey, you in the blue shirt. Of course, I couldn't tell I was wearing a blue shirt. He said, What the blankety blank are you driving those balls over here for? Are you crazy? But the motorcycle story probably is the most amusing. I, I came up with a great idea for combining a blind and deaf driver. I had a friend, a friend named Roy <laughs> Otterman. I bought a motorcycle. I would drive, and he would sit behind me and tell me where to go, right, left, red light, green light. It worked really well until one day we were driving down Lemon Grove Boulevard in Lemon Grove, and there was a Winchell's Donut Shop, donut shop that was robbed. We fit the profile. We were pulled over. And it wasn't, <laughs> it was only after we convinced the cop that we, you know, we didn't fit their profile because the getaway driver wasn't blind and his accomplice wasn't deaf. And once we showed them that, we got, they saw that on our license and stuff. And of course, I had no license. 
Uh, I actually <laughs> for driving while blind, and he let us drive away. Yeah, this is so said, nuts. Boy, he said, you better hope you get Judge Lord. This is the back the, uh, after story. And so I was, that's the last time I drove a motorcycle was then. And so I'm waiting to go to court. And I, they changed to the Judge Lord. That was really his real name. And yeah. uh, I said, Judge, I'm sorry. But the reason why I didn't have a license is I can't see to get one. He goes, what? You can't see to get a license? Well, then case dismissed. <laughs> really? Oh, yes. that's so cool. And I was sitting there thinking, these guys going to throw the book at me or something. He goes, well, case dismissed. Well, what, the, what are you wasting my time for? If you can't say, of course you can't get a license. He didn't think about the fact that I was driving without one. Oh, my God. That is hysterical. I, when, I, when I heard that, I mean, it just evokes such a an imagery. There's a blind guy riding a motorcycle with a deaf guy giving him guidance from behind, and they get pulled over yeah. by a cop, and they get they a ticket for one. driving without <laughs> Yeah, and I have I have all kinds of funny stories of crashes that I don't want to get into for time. I'm sake. sure I, I have a number of people that were not the only ones that had the nerve to get on the back. And one time I was dating a girl, and I said, "No, I'll take you for a ride." And then I'm asking her, "Okay, the light are we coming up to? Is it a is it a red light or a green light? Are we coming up to a light?" And then and then it was when she realized, "Oh my God, I've been on the back of this motorcycle. This guy can't see where he's going." <laughs> and my wife won't let me drive a motorcycle so <laughs> yeah i won't let my son drive a motorcycle because of the, the accidents i've been in because of it right i'm sure so i mean this is this is truly fascinating you are a fascinating man now tell us a little bit about the movie um because is, is there a documentary and a feature movie or are they, is that am i mixing the two up no, you're not. The documentary DELT, D-E-A-L-T, as in Delta Hand of Cards, uh, it came out, it uh, opened in New York last October, and to with you know, rave reviews across the country, and it's been received just very, very well, and I cannot take credit for it. it the producer, Luke Corum, and uh, Russell Groves, one of the, the producer, and Luke Corum was the director, and Bradley Jackson, one of the writers, but for uh, about... Four years, three to four years, I had a crew of six or more people following me and my family wherever we went with wow. as many as one to four and at the Academy Awards, as many as a dozen cameras going. And they are the ones that really put the story together and they had like 3,000 hours of footage. And um, to put it, uh, to narrow it down into a 90 minute narrative, uh, in this case documentary, was amazing. And so the effect that it's having on people you know, I can't take credit for that other than I was the weird subject. And, and, and uh, that's, that, is that available? Can people go see that oh, now? Yes. Uh, it's available on iTunes, Amazon Prime, Google Play, uh, uh, Comcast, uh, Hulu, any right. VOD, video on demand platform has it. It's also available on the, on the stores. And, uh, but what's kind of exciting is we, a variety magazine just announced in April that our producers have signed with uh, Court 5. And Mark Ordesky and Jane Fleming, they were, um, uh, with, they were with uh, uh, New Line Cinema, and he was the one that produced the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yep. And he won 17 Oscars just off those three films by themselves. And they're, this is, they're very excited about turning this into a uh, narrative, into a major motion picture. So, so who's going to play Richard? Well, that is all up to debate. They were talking about Matthew McConaughey for one of uh, the uh, Ryan Gosling was another suggestion, but none of the, all those, all that is yet to be determined because <laughs> you know, first, yeah, the first thing you get your script. I get and, it. Uh, these guys don't even know that they were names or even suggestions. No. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, who do you want to play you? Well, actually when my wife described Matthew McConaughey, um, I thought, you know, cause I, you know, I, I, I have a, I'm 64 and I can still kick the hiney of your average 30 year old in the gym. Right. And I do it quite often, mind you. And I'm <laughs> home with a full gym. So we work out every day. I haven't missed working out in 40, I can actually tell you almost down to the day, 47 years and, and you know, about eight months and so many days. And uh, so is somebody, they're going to be, have to be very physically athletic Yes. Because, like I said, doing all the stunt stuff that I did, that requires a certain amount of uh, agility and 
And then uh, at the same time, they're gonna have to have some good hands and do, and obviously I will have to work with them on certain things, but most of the stuff they, you know, obviously they won't be able to do because it's kind of what I do is exclusive to me. Yeah. There are a couple other people that have been working on those moves, but they're extremely, uh, almost impossible. You know, one of the things, the, one of the things the movie will have to show, um, which I think would be the most difficult thing is, is the level of discipline you know, when I read about the discipline you, you've had, and, you know, I, would you say it's discipline or would you say it's obsessiveness? Well, I call myself the poster boy for obsessive compulsive behavior and proud of it. Right. I, uh, you know, as we've been sitting here the whole time, I have not, I've been practicing moves the entire time we've been talking. I, I can hear I, that. I would not uh, have been able to, to talk with you. Uh, I turn my moves into subconscious habits so I'm able to practice while I'm doing other things. Um, I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I weighed, when I got my first black belt, I weighed 168 when I got my first degree black belt. Yeah. When I got my sixth degree, 28 years later, I weighed 168 and four ounces. No, I'm sorry, 168 and six ounces. Six wow. ounces difference after almost three decades. And my father-in-law said, if you would have went pee, you would have been even. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing that is insane so do you let's just do as we're getting towards the uh, it's the last quarter of the show tell us about delt i mean obviously that's that's the name of the documentary but it's also an acronym for, yes. for part uh, yes. of how you live and what you believe and just walk us through that a little if you would okay yeah i love giving keynote uh speeches entertainment to different companies around the country, around the world. And, uh, and I incorporate my cards with my speaking and my crazy life stories. And D stands for dreams. Our dreams fuel the fire in our belly. And of course, my dream was to be a card shark and a karate master. E stands for excellence. What opens doors is becoming an expert, achieving a state of excellence. And that was pushed by Steve Terrell, my first director. A yeah. stands for analysis. We must analyze our obstacles, must analyze our assets. We all have obstacles. We all have assets. L stands for loyalty. We must be loyal to our company, colleagues, customers, and I believe values such as honesty and integrity. And T stands for tenacity. And that's my favorite word, tenacity. And what sure. is tenacity? Tenacity is what breaks down the barriers that stand between us and our dream. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you, when you look at that, that path that you just laid out with the, those ac that acronym. How did you, I, and I'm really interested in this in a very personal level because our show is, is about full Monty leadership, which is revealing it all. Mm -hmm. I don't, I've not met anybody who has not hit hard times. I've not met anybody who has not felt defeated by something for a period of time. And that's part of what makes us human and, and makes the stories magical. In fact, is to see that. Was there a point in all this where you felt defeated or felt like the obstacle was too large, even for a while? Yes, there, I had become very successful. Mm -hmm. Then I got involved in a very mad, bad marriage with a woman that was an alcoholic mm -hmm. and who was trying to set me up with the mob to, put, to cut to the chase. Sure. And um, then, and you know, had uh, at that point, I had started uh, using some of my skills uh, in uh, playing uh, mainly heads up, high stake games, and uh, and then when I lost, you know, and I had, I was not rich, but I lost a uh, it was a little over over nine hundred thousand under a million is in that range, mm -hmm. which for me at that time this was in nineteen eight or about nineteen eighty when the market crashed in eighty seven and eighty eight time eighty nine time frame somewhere around then. So I burst virtually everything I had, I, I lost. And, um, and then I found, found out that uh, my ex-wife was trying to set me up with this mob guy that kept following me around the world. He'd be on the same flight I was on, offer me hundreds of thousands of dollars to play cards out uh, in Sun City. He even tried to give me a, a five carat diamond pinky ring that was worth 70 grand just as a token of his good faith. And that's what he was. He was a diamond broker, diamond merchant wow. from South Africa. But anyway, um, so I basically lost everything, but I figured um, uh, I could make it back. And then I met my beautiful wife, Kim, Kim Turner. We've been together 28 years now. 
and she's the treasure of all treasures. I would trade all my skills, everything I have in for her. If I had the choice of her or everything else, I would take her. Um, uh, uh, and it was during my time with her when I lost the rest of my sight. And part of Delt does kind of get into this. And I was very stubborn. I was uh, glad that I had what I had. In other words, I could walk alongside somebody and be able to see their shadow and still feel independent. Right. But when I got to the point where I had to touch somebody or somebody had to touch me, that became a challenge. And I wouldn't admit it. And because of my Charles Bonnet syndrome, I didn't realize what was left was all artificial. In other words, I can, I can wave my hand in front of my face and I can close my eyes and I see the same colors and I will see an object moving back and forth. But I see the same thing with my eyes open or closed. I didn't realize that there was nothing left, that I couldn't do this and be able to tell there's a hand there. Mm. And, and, and my wife, you know, they would watch me run into doors, run into walls, run into solid brick buildings, just splitting my head over and over and over. And they, and, I, and they would try to get through to me, but I was just stubborn and I didn't want to hear it. Um, but eventually I had to accept that, you know, because I, I, I was a, I was a, fun, I was a, un, I was, how do I, how do I say this? I was a disabled person that I didn't have to be dependent on people. Right. Becoming a disabled person where I had to be dependent on people, that I didn't like. And that was the challenge. And now I go, what the heck? Get over it. And that's what she would tell me. Get over yourself. Get over it. It is what it is. You know, she said, you know, let's just pray about it and just ask, ask that we uh, ask God to give us the strength to come through, get through these, uh, the, the situation, adapt to it. Uh, and of course, my sister, who was a lot, uh, she was way ahead of me in the technology and the, the visual technology, talking computers and so on. Yeah. You know, she, um, would try to get me to use a cane or, and she got a dog and, and she was like me. She ran and owned and uh, founded one of the largest construction companies in the state of Idaho. She was a very <laughs> successful woman on her, in her own right. And, um, sure. uh, but, and she finally would tell me, you got to start getting a talking computer. You got to do this and got to do that. And, and I was just stubborn and resistant, but eventually I finally yielded and I'm man, the technology out there and, is so Isaac. utterly amazing when mm -hmm. things at Apple and and uh, just across the board what they're doing is it, I'm I'm so thrilled and excited that my wife got me to get over myself and say you know this is the real reality that you're living in now let's uh, live in reality instead of your own fantasy world right and, uh, well so you you like I said you've had extraordinary discipline you amazing tenacity you know, all of those things, you've followed your dreams, you've made things happen that would have really seemed impossible. Uh, and I've often said, I truly believe this with all my heart, that the greatest leaders in the world are obsessed. And you clearly have shown that. And we're obsessed about whatever we're obsessed about. I don't think it's particularly a negative thing. Right. Um, but at the same time, um, I think my experience is working with leaders as I do around the world who are at the top of their game, the best of the best have not stopped, meaning they're still dedicated and they're usually dedicated in two areas, in becoming better at whatever they're already magnificent at, you know, like you sitting there practicing as we play, as we speak, but also that they are also incredibly dedicated to their own growth, their own development, their own understanding of themselves. What about yourself are you still working on, Richard? Well, I, you know, like you said, I, I, can, I, I just maintain all my same disciplines. I don't let, uh, I don't let age say, uh, uh, let me put it another way, I'm not going down. Right. <laughs> In other words, I, I, I'm 64 and I still have a six pack and I can still, like I said, I'm still really strong, but not as strong as not nearly as strong as I used to be. But I still I'm not going down I maintain my all my disciplines with the cards, even though the computer does take up some of the time, because when I'm on a keyboard, I cannot obviously can't be practicing. So right. Some of that has. Uh, but what are you working on in yourself as a human myself. being? Well, I, I look at myself. I look at the, I look at the fact that I can't be here by accident. I think about creation. I think about versus 
uh, just some kind of an explosion and a rock flies across the universe and bang, turns into a monkey and here I am. Versus right. some intelligence behind the scene that have created color. So I'm fascinated by color, which is strange. I'm fascinated by the fact that every piece of our planet, everything, birds have been painted by this critter. Uh, trees, plants, fish. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, just the, uh, there's just things that are constantly fascinating my mind that shows that I, I believe that I'm not here by accident. None of us are here by accident. We all have certain gifts. We all have certain challenges. Um, I always, I hate to say this, but I think one of the worst disabilities is just laziness or, or procrastination. And when I said that on Penn and Teller, people around the world were going, oh my gosh, I guess I'm, I qualify for disability. And I don't yeah. even remember saying it on the show, to be perfectly honest, until the day, and I go, did I say that? That's but, a profound insight, for sure. Yeah. With all this discipline, I mean, like you said, you go to the gym, you work out, you still got your six pack, you, you obviously you're practicing all these kinds of things. Uh, and you know, you're speaking all, and, and all these amazing things you're doing. But what's your guilty pleasure? My guilty pleasure. Yeah. Ah, what's well, the what's the thing that like? Yeah, this I'm doesn't good. really fall in line with that, but I really ooh, that's delicious. I enjoy that. Well, right now it's uh, some. Uh, I'd have to ask my son what it was. Some kind of uh, stuff that I dip my cashews in, and it's <laughs> and uh, it's a chocolate flavored tasting stuff. I take a spoon, I dip it in this chocolate stuff, and then I dip my cashews in it. And I eat it. And uh, so that's my thing of the month right now. That I <laughs> um, uh, but I, uh, but the, the thing, what I'm work, uh, working on, on myself again is also to relax in certain right. ways. I, my disciplines are my disciplines. Sure. I, I, I am what I am. My, my energy level is what it is. Uh, but what I, enjoy as much as anything is to sit down in the evening with my wife and just have time with my wife and yeah. with my time with my son. I love my wife. I love traveling with her. We've been all over the world. My son, we just finished. We literally circled the world in the past couple of weeks from here to Atlanta, to Stuttgart, Germany, to Frankfurt, Germany, to Shanghai, China, to North Korea. Or, I'm sorry, South Korea. I didn't step over the line. <laughs> South Korea to, uh, to you, you mean you weren't not, you weren't there negotiating yeah, I mean, I mean, nuclear weapons? Uh, <laughs> to put a, a, a better deal together. Well, yeah, I mean, you you could have you could have you could have showed him some things with the cards. Maybe the whole thing would have gone differently with you. There you go. <laughs> Maybe that's what we should do. We should put you in charge and have you have a little word with uh, a guy who lives in Russia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, but this is this has been, line is, you know, just having time with my family, my family, right, uh, and, and and being sensitive to them and yes. to their needs, and not just putting myself first, my right. own ego, my own uh, desires, you know, to, to 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 think about others. And I've been very fortunate that uh, Delta is speaking to people around the world. People watch it on air. You watch it on American Airlines, Delta Airlines. And they're seeing it uh, across the globe, and people are being touched. Their lives are being changed. And uh, when we, we when we go to premieres or places, people are saying how it it really affected them. And 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 I'm blessed that somehow this strange guy with all this weird energy that uh, plays with a deck of cards is a actually able to make an impact on people's lives. Uh, that is a cool thing. And I and I and I have to actually. Pinch, I don't even pinch myself is the right word. I have to separate myself from myself because I can't really believe it, that sure. it's true or that everything that's happened to me has happened. It feels like or sounds like something you'd read in a novel. Man, it's amazing. So as we come to the end of the show, what I want to ask you is this. You know, we, we have a, a fabulous listenership. There's over 600,000 people per, um, per, uh, per, per month listening to our show, watching our show on video and audio. Uh, you know, just just the list downloads of just listening is, is six hundred thousand. Then we got the videos. We're going out on Roku TV and all these different outlets. And and I want to make sure that those people walk away. It's always my desire to have people walk away from watching, listening to the show, and say, 
This is Richard's practical advice. What is the thing you want them to get? Because information is worth the hole in the donut if we don't apply it. So what is it you want them to walk away and put into action in the next, preferably 24 hours, but certainly the next five working days? What would you say, go do this? I would say don't let anyone tell you that you can't do something or something's impossible. As I said, take possible out of impossible. And I understand that time to time, we're all dealt a bad hand or two, but it's how we approach that hand. If we choose to fold, whine, complain, sit on our pity pot, or become a warrior and go all in, you know, that's what separates the losers from the winners. And like I said, don't let anyone tell you you can't play. Take possible out of impossible. That is fantastic, and, um, Mike. And it, can you see that card there? Let me see. Oh. No, I didn't see it. Go again. Yep, sorry. Yep. Oh, sh- 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 I know. I did shuffling all the time. I just cut a card, and and uh, I was uh, going to say become an ace, but um, I obviously dropped the card after I shipped it to you. So, oh, I think I found it. Oh, is that, can you see that? Yes, indeed. What is it? Ace of Spades. Oh, there you have it. The number one card. My son's name is Ace Your of son's Spades. Name. So it is. S-B-A-D-E-S. <laughs> Become the best. That's awesome, mate. Listen. I have loved having you on here. Thank you so much for your time, your energy, your commitment, and for inspiring us all. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you. I'm very honored that you asked me. I really am very honored. And I thank you and I thank your listeners. Thank you. And can you please, again, tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and all the fabulous resources that you have, the website, please. Uh, RichardTurner52.com is my website. Ace of T52 is my YouTube channel. Uh, DeltMovie.com is where you can see anything about the film. Right. But those Fabulous. Are the, those are the main things, RichardTurner52.com. Or just Google Richard Turner. I, 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 I'm I the first person that pops up. And DeltMovie.com. DeltMovie.com. Mm-hmm. Fabulous. Well, that, that's awesome, mate. Thank you so much. I hope you'll stay with us to the end. We're going to go say goodbye to everybody else. I want to thank you on behalf of myself and our listeners. It's been truly inspiring. I, I am really excited to have this show get released and, and listen to all the amazing feedback, and we'll certainly let you know when that's going to happen. Please stay with us to the end. And for you, dear listener, dear viewer, as always, I say to you, please don't just listen Put it in action. Whatever the shit is that you think you've got to get over. Listen, I've had some rotten crap in my life, and 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 I get it. I mean, there's times when you feel just beaten down by it, and you wonder if it's possible to come over it. But if you can just watch this man, and and I encourage you to go watch the videos of him doing what he does, it's insane because it really makes you grasp that all the limitations exist between your ears. They're not out in the world at all. So please remember, get over to Facebook, go into the Facebook group, Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast in Facebook. Chat about this episode. Share with your friends about this episode. Share this episode. Go on to iTunes, rate, review, subscribe to the show. It was fabulous. We were so grateful to have Richard with us. And remember, the research consistently shows that one of the biggest challenges facing even the most successful companies can be somewhat counterintuitive in these fast-growing companies often hit a point where they realize that they are spending a fortune training, developing their talent, but only to have them leave at an alarming rate. If you're sick of training and developing your talent, only have them leave before you get your ROI, then come talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com, where we provide the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by tapping into purpose fullmontyleadership.com providing you with the concrete soft skills to get you and your organization to the top and keep you there. Why? Because you can't outsource authenticity. And remember to stop by the matrix, matrix matrix.fullmontyleadership.com You don't need a triple W, just matrix.fullmontyleadership.com and get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment tool valued at $197. Absolutely free to you for being a listener. Go there, find out about the five areas of leadership and how you can tap into them and make yourself a truly great leader remember you can find us on google play and alexa just say play dove baron podcast thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know till next time stay curious my friend stay curious about the limitations you have about who you are and what you're capable of 
and how they might actually be full of it. And you know what it is. I'm Del Baron, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness to reach that next level of clarity, focus, and purpose, and profit in your life, in your business, in your leadership impact. And I am out.